citizens to be heard. The portion of the meeting that we ask you to come forward, state your name and address, and they have it for the record. Our policy requires you to stay under three minutes so that others have time to be heard. Please direct council as a whole, not to engage individual members of council debate. It's our policy to follow through almost immediately with the concern. We also ask any groups that want to address the council designated spokesperson again in order to get everybody up to the microphone and heard. Having said that, are there any citizens wishing to be heard tonight? Me. I do. I don't Kelly. know who you are. Kelly Saxon. I hate all my place. Excuse me. But also Georgia. Excuse me. Um, Mayor and Council, I come before you the citizens to be heard concerning the warm and shelter. Our homeless shelters remain full and the plan that is in place to refer people to these shelters during bad weather is not a reliable option. We need a true plan in place for inclement weather. Moultrie, Quitman, Thomasville, just to name a few, um, had something in place, our surrounding areas had something in place during this 29 degree weather. Um, our current emergency plan seems to center more towards pets, plants, and pipes. Sometimes in advocating for the well-being of people in need, we feel like red-headed stepchildren. We need your help. I do want to say, when we come to you, the soup kitchen closure, we came to you about this. We had a meeting, and the city manager and the city assistant manager came down and helped us in this soup kitchen and donated items out of their pockets. We appreciate that. Councilman Hardin, before he even became a councilman, has supported the soup kitchen even before it closed. I do want to thank you for that Stump Out Homelessness event that you all helped to sponsor with us um, last week or the week before last. Also, I came before you concerning um, some barriers to employment that we were facing with the credential needed for employment. You all have fixed that as of January the 1st. We appreciate that. We had that point in time count um, last week and under the direction of uh, Mr. Nietzsche Riley, through our neighborhood development and her staff, they helped us to count and meet the needs of people in our community. So we thank you for that. We still have more issues to tackle and work to do. All, we all know that Rome was not built in a day. But we do know that if we do nothing, it would never be built. I appreciate you all not being a big bad wolf government. I appreciate the open door policy with no barriers to citizens who want to be heard. I appreciate you letting me speak today. Thank you. Kelly, thank you for your passion. Thank you for your shirt too, that says thankful. Are there any other citizens which you can be heard? How y'all doing? Lewis Gordon, Shannon Circle. Um, that was a look at God moment because what I'm here to talk to you about today. So last year we assisted um, VSU students who were living in Blanton Commons. Um, they came under new management and the students at the beginning of the year got like really short notice that they would basically be kicked out. Um, we worked with the tenants union um, trying to talk to the management there for um, a decrease in some of the fees because like they were saying, if, hey, we got to find a place to go we can't pay these extra fees to move out really quickly. And they were also dealing with living conditions that were not suitable for them. Um, as Ms. Saxon just um, brought up, we do have an issue with homelessness. And one of those groups right now are college students, y'all. Um, the cost of college is insurmountable now. Most people going to college now will never, out, will, will never get rid of their student loan debt, okay? Um, two of our biggest draws here in Valdosta are the military base and the college. A lot of our business owners here know if you're going to do sustained business in Valdosta, you got to be able to deal with military, college, and then the at-home population, right? I think that we can do a lot when it comes to taking care of these students. We should not have such a large population of homeless college students. Um, last time I checked, I'm wanting to say it was somewhere around 900. I think it was 100 college students, y'all. Think about the barriers to learning that that creates. Think about the lasting stain that that creates when we attach that to Valdosta's name. I do appreciate I was an art history, well, I was an art major, loved art history, Rome. 
Um, Rome has a thing where they, they feel that Rome was founded by Romulus and Remus, who were um, nurtured by a she-wolf. The Roman people carried that into the way that they handled business, right? I think that when we talk about that wolf, we need to be as aggressive as that, that kind of spirit about handling these problems, guys. Because I know we say, okay, Rome wasn't built in a day, but think about what it feels like when you are a college student, homeless, trying to deal with student loans, worried about where your next meal comes from, worried about where you're gonna lay your head at night. They need an advocate. And we have enough people here who care about these kids to come together and solve this issue. Um, Y'all know my office, we're always here to help, whatever we can do. We have enough people here who care. We should not have homeless college students. Thank y'all. Lewis, thank you. Are there any other instances of which you can be heard at this time? Looks like I'm last. You say your name, I bet you're not last. <laughs> Bill Love, 2207 Azalea Drive. Congratulations, Nick. Great thank campaign. You. Thank you. Guys, I'm here to talk about the police department. We don't have enough police. We're not making enough effort to make ourselves safe in this community. We're hearing shots every night over on Deborah Drive. I used to live on Deborah Drive. I sold that house, but I still have friends that I grew up with that mothers are still living at, and they hear shots every night. It was reported to me that our police department are dumbing down the, this, the codes that they uh, report to the GBI. Now, I don't know if that's a fact or not, but we need to get accurate reporting on what our police department's doing. I don't blame anyone in the police department. This has got to your level. And I'm, Nick, not you included, because you get a, you get a pass on this one, but you guys have been here. We've had a problem and no one's addressed it to, uh, to satisfaction of anybody. Matter of fact, it might have gotten worse. When we do the same thing we've been doing for two years, saying take your $15 and go do your interview, and we don't, still don't have enough, we, that must not be working. I don't know how you change it. I don't know what you do. I can find out. But to say that Lowndes County, the Lowndes County Sheriff's Department, is stealing our people is not true either. I've talked to those guys. They come over freely and they go to them. So that's not a problem. What I would like to see happen is an exit interview from a private source. When somebody in the police department quits, they go and exit interview out, but we're not doing it. You get a private source, we don't name who they were, and let's find out where the problem is. Because we need a police force, because deaths are starting to rise, shots are starting to rise. Heck, I saw three kids riding down the sidewalk, riding over here on motorcycles. Down the sidewalk, they passed two police cars, ours. So and they didn't turn around and go get them, they just let them go. And these weren't the little scooters. These were regular dirt bikes. So I've gone to the GBI, I've put my request for information in there. I'll be back, it takes eight to six weeks. I wanna see what the total number of reports were last year. But let's work together. We can make our community safe. We have to make our community safe. And if this is not number one on your list, Gentlemen, ladies, it should be. Because it could be your child that gets shot like the poor girl over in Rimerson. Thank you. Hang around. Thank you. Appreciate it. Are any other citizens wishing to be heard at this time? George Boston, Ryan, 504 Oak Drive, Boston, Georgia. I'm under a 11-year criminal trespass by the Lowndes County Sheriff's Department or the Lowndes County School System, and nobody will remove me in writing. That was after the KJ death, as if though they didn't want me recording those kids who may want to speak with me. On Wednesday this week, when the tour of Liberty theater, I was recording as free and a Valdosta police, no, a code enforcer came and told me that I had to move or he would call the police. 
I told him and explained to him I do this across the state and America, really, because I've been on Nebraska doing the same thing. Omaha, Nebraska, doing the same thing. So I'm very familiar with the law. I told him that you don't have any tape here down the sidewalk. You only have the street says closed. I said, I respect that. That's why I didn't drive my vehicle. But there was nothing to divide the sidewalk. And sidewalks to me are open to the public. And I know you all put out signs because I've seen them saying sidewalk closed. So the police officer came out, I explained to him, and he recorded, he said, that makes sense what you're saying. I said, no, it's, it's the truth. This code enforcer who was black, I can't think of his name, he called another set of police officers, two more came. And I told him, I'm ready to be arrested and I'm gonna sue. Make a long story short, It wasn't too long before those second set of police officers took that crime scene tape and taped it to the building so nobody could go across the sidewalk. That's what they should have done in the first place. They just made a correction that I could see. And I was trying to tell these, the, the code enforcer, and I have it on video, you, you're gonna see it on my YouTube channel, there was people next to the building. And I said, you didn't say nothing to those people. I got pictures. So I just want to uh, agree with Mr. Love that there's a great possibility that we need more training or something in our police department. What makes me so sick at night, I haven't seen a city yet. There's so many cars driving with their headlights out at night. Have y'all noticed that? And if you haven't seen it, you will hear about it when somebody had an accident may have already been accidents. I see police officers. I've seen one state patrol. See the lights out. Nobody say nothing. And I'm scared as hell anyway, traveling the streets the way things are. Peace, man. Tell y'all good evening. Thank you, George. Are there any other citizens wishing to be here? Hey, my name is Andy Fudge. I live on 2104 Pin Oak Circle. And I'm the recipient of most of that rain and flood water that comes to Lakeland Avenue. I'm about three houses from the fire station. And since the year 2000, I keep about 40 to 45, 50 pound sandbags in my yard to put out on a heavy rain. And uh, getting a little older, about 60, the elbows and shoulders not working anymore that good, you know, to be picking up some sandbags. So hopefully this retention pond would have you going to be put on Lakeland is going to help because it wasn't just a hurricane, my house was flooded three times. Okay, when the hurricane hit, my house had 22 inches of water inside and my neighbor that shares a fence with it had none. Okay, years before, before you built the new annex for the city, I came down to the city when I was still in the Air Force and asked about the permit for the foundation of my home. I was told it was 28 inches. Question information again, Three weeks ago, nobody knows where it's at. So hopefully this retention problem, what have you got going on, hopefully it works. Because like I said, I'm, I'm, my body can't keep lifting them sandbags, you know. So and then if I sell it to one of you guys as family members, I don't have to tell them it floods because it's not a flood zone. You know what I mean? All right. Thanks for your time. Thank you. We'll keep our fingers crossed on that. Any other citizens wishing to be heard at this time? Hi there, John Quarterman, uh, 3338 Country Club Road. Sweet L, EMB 336. That's where I get my mail. Okay, so um, if y'all lose a water goat, call Walls. We can probably find it and retrieve it for you. And um, while I thoroughly agree with the county engineer's approach of trying to stop the trash before it gets into the creeks, um, A, the water goats also cost far less than even the engineering um, preparation that he's talking about for this project he just talked about. I, I, I thoroughly agree with that project. As you just heard, it's well needed in that location. And that project may do a lot to solve the 
ongoing difficulties with trash getting down one mile branch and some of the sewage spills because of the flooding and of course the flooding itself. So that's a great project. My point is simply a few more water goats downstream on some of the creeks such as I hear there's a location on three mile branch where the city could put one uh, would also be a good thing. And also to keep the trash out of the creeks I would like to commend the uh, city marshals because they have for some months now been notifying parking lot owners and if necessary citing them about not having trash cans and about letting trash get off their properties which the city ordinances say they should not do. And we're seeing some results. There's parking lots where trash cans are popping up. So that's good. I know that's slow but I commend the marshals for starting the process at least and having some some results. I will note that uh, last time I looked in the Five Points parking lot, which is owned by the city, I didn't see any trash cans. And also over on St. Augustine Road in the parking lot down by Hightower Creek, where I videoed the mayor December a year ago, looking at where people stop and throw out their fast food because there's no trash can. Now they shouldn't throw it out anyway, of course. But if there's a trash can, they'd be much more likely to put it in the trash can. And the ordinances say not only there must be trash cans, they must be strategically placed. So it'd be really nice after a year and counting to get a few trash cans down there. So it's more like that that can be done. Um, but anyway, I would like to commend the city engineer for that project and others he's working on, and also the utilities director. I noticed there seem to be fewer spills, they stop faster, and they get reported better. So I know you'll, you'll think this is out of character, but I came mostly to compliment the city of Valdosta. Thank you. Oh, oh one, one more thing. You're all invited to the chairman and mayor's battle, oh, excuse me, mayor and chairman's battle, March 2nd starting at Langdale Park boat ramp, going down to Troopville boat ramp. Y'all come. I'll finish the rest of my comments. <laughs> Are there any other citizens who should be heard at this time? Seeing none, we'll uh, end up and turn it over to the city manager's report. A lot going on in the next uh, February. So uh, some, some uh, great things to get involved in. We have our Young Game Changers Steering Committee that's going to kick off on February the 1st, 10 a.m. Uh, at the Women's Building. Also on February the 1st, the Love Your Downtown, Downtown Campaign begins. Downtown Valdosta, February the 3rd, noon to 7 p.m. Our second annual Big Game Bash with Pepsi. This, is going to be, this will take place at uh, Unity Park. February the 5th, starting at 11 a.m. Our National Burn Awareness Proclamation, Fire Station 1. February the 7th, 10 a.m., uh, the groundbreaking for Harvest Station. This will take place at 401. 14 at 11 a.m., the Employee Valentine's Day Luncheon will be held at 1901 Barack Obama Boulevard. And final February the 15th, 10 a.m., our Arbor Day event which will take place at the Sunset Hill Cemetery. Fantastic. I'll uh, add a couple more just from memory. Um, February 15th at 11.30, the uh, rededication of Southside Library. Um, almost doubled in scope and scale and size and uh, much needed. It's a cultural center on uh, Griffin Avenue in that part of town. It's just a, a fantastic project that was an all-in project from uh, everything from our state center to our city staff and otherwise, and that fantastic board and friends of the library. It was a great, great all-in fundraiser to expand that, almost double that size and enhance that corridor where we have so much activity going as well. <coughs> um, before I turn it over to council comments on uh, Saturday, and tonight we're all running up to Atlanta. It's our city's United Summit, so we'll be there till Monday for the most part. I'll be coming back on Saturday to represent all our council at a funeral. It'll be a military funeral in that beautiful pavilion that they have at the, uh, the uh, cemetery right ahead of Foxborough there. 1950, a Velasta resident left for war, the Korean War. He had already served in World War II. His remains were just identified. Missing in action since that time, they were just identified and brought back home. 
And on Saturday at 2 o'clock, U.S. Master Sergeant Roy E. Burial will get his day, his burial, and an honor in our city forevermore. That that day be remembered for him and his service to God and country as well. So if you're, uh, if you're free, come on out. It's at 2 o'clock, the honor will have our own as well. Council, we'll turn it over to you for comments. Um, Mayor and Council, I'm asking your assistant in this that, uh, help need to be done in the city of Valdosta. Uh, uh, my understanding, housing have cameras up, but they are not on. Uh, some of the shooting that's being done in my district at nighttime, guns are being shot every night. You can hear in your bedroom windows and etc. At one time, we had a camera down at the Liberty West area that did uh, go in south and north, and also it would pull Brookwood, Jane, and et cetera, if anything was happening in that area. Also, we, I'm asking if we could get some cameras down in the Ponte Rosa area, in those apartment areas down on those light poles. If, from my understanding, that Hudson Docket has the cameras also, but their housing is paying for these cameras, but they're not connected or something. In that kind of way, we can look into that, Mr. Hardy, to see what can be done, can be done to turn, to put, put these cameras back up to par yes, in sir. these housing areas that they will, they can focus down in those streets areas and they can see, it would help Chief Medellin <clears throat> see who is doing some of this shooting because they're shooting every night. I mean, in my district, every night, I hear it in my bedroom. You don't know whether to get up or to stay still, but somebody's shooting in those areas every night and they also do it on the south side. By the time they are calling uh, to the police department, by the time they get there, nobody's talking until something happens and then still nobody's talking. So if we could get some cameras up, or uh, get those cameras uh, reactivated in those areas, that would help some of this that's going on in these different districts and et cetera. And I'm just asking for help, that's all. Absolutely. Uh, piggyback on that, I've had some uh, citizens reach out to me. Um, <coughs> we have had, and um, I, I hated actually um, uh, my entire time of being on the council these past couple of weeks. These emails that come through with, uh, I mean, like homicide, suicide, after, uh, just you know, shooting after shooting, and uh, of course, uh, it's been going on a while, so we definitely need to tackle that. But I've had citizens reach out to me. Uh, about uh, not even cameras, just more so lighting. Um, and I know that was uh, something um, that we've been working on, but if we can pay uh, or maybe be more aggressive in getting some lights in some of those areas, um, I think that'll help as well. Um, and uh, yeah, def definitely need lighting in some of those areas. You know, it's dark, it's dark areas and, and they're not able to see um, and citizens are, don't feel safe. Councilman Thicke, Councilman. Good. And there, Sandy? No. Thomas? Unfortunately, uh, you're correct. Uh, Councilwoman Cody and Councilman uh, Harden. About three years ago on Oliver Street, there was uh, I guess, several calls.
Romans 8 and 7 says, Because the carnal of mine is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. To God be the glory. that ran entirely on bound black labor, regularly abused, and yeah, working for no pay. Yeah, Boston, thank you so much. as we all know, right. was the seat of Lowndes County, just miles to the east of Kendalloo. The city, our city, was founded one month after the election of Abraham Lincoln and four prior to Georgia's secession. After the war, the town became a cotton farming hub for South Georgia, the bulk of former slaves in the region turning to sharecropping to survive. But while sharecropping was a value added for landowners without the resources for acquiring state contracts, that was the
The Crimes of Kinder Lewin. Valdosta Lounge County, Georgia. Convict Leasing in Valdosta, Georgia, 229-333-5947. Tiello at valdosta.edu website of info. Dr. Thomas Aiello. Professor of History. Ph.D. in History. University of Arkansas, 2007. Ph.D. in Anthrozoology. University of Exeter, United Kingdom, 2021. Teaching Fields, African American History to 1865, African American History since 1865, American Cultural and Intellectual History, Animal Studies, Vegan Studies. Thomas Aiello is a professor of history, Africana studies, and anthrozoology. He received his first PhD from the University of Arkansas in 2007 and his second from the University of Exeter in 2021. The bulk of his courses relate to all measures of African American history, from early slavery to black power, and all aspects of animal studies. His research interests are broader, covering 20th century United States cultural and intellectual history, 20th century African American cultural and intellectual history in a variety of different settings, and animal studies, critical animal studies, and anthrozoology. You can learn more at www.thomasiellobooks.com. He is the author of Practical Radicalism and the Great Migration, a cultural geography of the Scott Newspaper Syndicate, Athens, University of Georgia Press, forthcoming. The Art of Deliberate Disunity, The Life and Times of Louis E. Lomax, Durham, Duke University Press, 2021. Brath, Cecil Alum. Color Us Colored. The American Negro Leadership Official Coloring Book, Editor and Annotator, Jackson, University Press of Mississippi, 2021. The Trouble in Room 519, The Life and Times of Gordon Malherbe Hillman, Author and Murderer, Money, Matricide, and Marginal Fiction in the Early 20th Century, Baton Rouge, Louisiana State University Press, 2021. Hoops, A Cultural History of Basketball in America, Lanham, Maryland, Roman and Littlefield, 2022. The Grapevine of the Black South, the Scott Newspaper Syndicate in the Generation Before the Civil Rights Movement, Athens, University of Georgia Press, 2018. Dixie Ball, Race and Professional Basketball in the Deep South, 1947 to 1979, Knoxville, University of Tennessee Press, 2019. New Orleans Sports, Playing Hard in the Big Easy, Fayetteville, University of Arkansas Press, 2019. The Battle for the Souls of Black Folk, W.E.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, and the Debate that Shaped the Course of Civil Rights, Westport, Connecticut, Prieger, 2016. Jim Crow's Last Stand, Non-Unanimous Criminal Jury Verdicts in Louisiana, Baton Rouge, Louisiana State University Press, 2015. Model airplanes are decadent and depraved, the glue-sniffing epidemic of the 1960s, DeKalb, Illinois, Northern Illinois University Press, 2015. Curlin, Robert T. The Voice of the Negro, 1919, Editor, Lewiston, New York, Edwin Mellon Press, 2013. The Devil's Messages, Language and Contested Space in 20th Century America, San Diego, California, Cognella, 2013. The Kings of Casino Park, Race and Race Baseball in the Lost Season of 1932, Monroe, L.A., Tuscaloosa, University of Alabama Press, 2011. Lawson, David. Paul Morphy, The Pride and Sorrow of Chess, Editor, Lafayette, Louisiana, University of Louisiana at Lafayette Press, 2010. Bayou Classic, 
The Grambling Southern Football Rivalry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana State University Press, 2010. Burley, Dan. Dan Burley's Jive, Editor, DeKalb, Illinois, Northern Illinois University Press, 2009. He is also the author of more than 50 peer-reviewed articles on American history, anthropology, critical animal studies, philosophy, religion, linguistics, and culture, copies of which are available at www.thomasayellowbooks.com. The Ghetto Free Press Social Media Reporting George Boston Rines, 229-251-8645 Bostombre at gmail.com YouTube channel Bostombre Facebook, George Boston Rines Motto, we report what others ignore on behalf of the public right to know without the whiteouts by those in the clique and among the slicks. St. John 832, St. Luke 418 Lasty, don't talk about the dream, but start working the dream for faith without work is dead. I'm Ann Price, I'm a professor in the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Criminal Justice, and on behalf of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences Lecture Series and the VSU Africana Studies Program, I'd like to welcome you back for our first presentation of 2024. The Lecture Series hosts monthly presentations throughout the academic year for our VSU community and the public. And today we are so pleased to have Dr. Tom Aiello, Professor of History and Africana Studies, speaking to us on the crimes of Kinderloo, convict leasing in Valdosta, and why you should be an Africana Studies minor. Uh, Dr. Aiello holds PhDs in History from the University of Arkansas and Anthrozoology from the University of Exeter. His research interests cover 20th century United States cultural and intellectual history, 20th century African-American cultural and intellectual history in a variety of settings, critical animal studies, and anthrozoology. He has published more than 20 books, including The Grapevine of the Black South, 
the Scott Newspaper Syndicate in the Generation Before the Civil Rights Movement, for which he received the 2019 uh, Book Award from the American Journalism Historians Association, and The Life and Times of Louis Lomax, The Art of Deliberate Disunity, which was nominated for the Pulitzer. And best of all, we are so happy to let you know that we did not bring him in to speak from another university. <laughs> he is our own professor right here at Valdosta State, and you can take classes with him in fall, spring, or summer. So please welcome Dr. Aiello. Thank you, everybody. All right. So, uh, I'm so glad all of you are here. This is a lot of people. Um, so, Lula Frazier lived in Waycross. I don't have a picture of her. <laughs> because there is no known picture of her. To southern white Georgia, she didn't matter. So let's say this is Lula Frazier. Or this. Or this. But Lula Frazier lived in Waycross. And being a black woman at the turn of the 20th century could be a dangerous thing. In 1902, Frazier was at home, where she lived with her husband. But the peace of the afternoon was broken by the noise and anger of white sheriff's deputies, who took her from her home and into custody. They charged her with living in adultery, still a crime in the early 20th century, even as she tried to explain to them that she was married. When she arrived at the sheriff's office, she was interrogated by the white sheriff of Ware County, Thomas McClellan. And while all that was going on, a white lawyer named William F. Crawley showed up out of the blue almost as if he knew what was going on. And he volunteered to represent her. Frazier was unsure, but McClellan pressured her to accept his services. She didn't have any money. She couldn't afford a lawyer. But she didn't want to prove, but didn't she want to prove that she was actually married? She'd need a lawyer to do that, McClellan told her. So she reluctantly accepted even though she needed no lawyer to prove that she was married. And during the ordeal, officials easily discovered that her protests were correct, that she was, in fact, married to the man in her house. For the briefest moment, she thought with guarded relief that a crisis had been averted, one of false accusation that had affected so many black residents of South Georgia since the end of the slave period but only for the briefest moment. McClellan and Crawley told her that they had verified her marriage, but now she owed money to Crawley for his legal services. I did not see why I owed him anything, and I had not stood any trial, she explained. He had just showed up and now wanted payment, a payment she obviously didn't have. And so, the two white men called Edward McCree, a member of the vaunted Lowndes County McCree family, owners of the Kinderloo convict camp just outside of Valdosta on what is now Highway 84. The McCrees were controversial figures in the state because of their behavior towards black convicts at Kinderloo. But they were scions of the local community. Edward McCree, for example, had just won a seat in the state legislature to be Lowndes County's representative, where he would serve three terms. So McClellan and Crawley wired the McCrees to come to Waycross for woman. The McCrees agreed to pay $50 to acquire Frazier, then took her back to Kinderloo to work her in bondage for nine months. Frazier was not, then, a convict. She wasn't even a debt peon in the traditional way we think of debt peonage. She was taken to Kinderloo after intentionally being tricked into her own bondage. 
when she finally made it back to the Ware County Board of Commissioners in Waycross nine months later, she testified to the horror of her ordeal. Were you allowed your freedom when you got there? The commission asked. I was locked up at night until two weeks ago, she told them. How long have you been there? Nine months. Did they pay you anything? They never paid me any money while I was there. They promised to pay me $5 a month, but never have paid me anything. What did you do there? The commissioners asked. I worked in the field and milked and cooked for the hands. Did they whip you any? They whipped me twice with a leather strap wide as your four fingers. What did they whip you for? Well, they claimed I was trying to run away one day when I went to the cow pen, and another time they said I was neglecting my work. That wasn't all. The McCrees also asked her to bind her eight-year-old son to the plantation as well. When she refused, they told her they would get him anyway, that her presence at Kinderloo was tacit consent to take the boy into bondage as long as she was there. And then there was the forced marriage. Mr. Ed McCree made me marry a man named Henry Hadley. Didn't you tell him you were already married and had a husband here in Waycross? Asked the commissioners. Yes, sir. I told him I had a husband here, but he laughed and said it didn't make any difference as I would never see him no more. Who married you? A man named All Britain. Did you have any license? Well, they had a paper there. I don't know whether it was a license or not. She was housed with three other women, Sally Powell and Maggie Hardy from Waycross and Ida Wilson from Valdosta. The men were kept in separate quarters nearby. You say you were whipped there, she was asked. Who whipped you? Mr. Ed McCree whipped me one time and Mr. Will McCree whipped me another time. They made me lie down across a bunk, and when Mr. Will whipped me, he made Ida Wilson hold my hands and Jim Henry hold my feet. He turned my clothes up and whipped me with a leather strap. McCree told her that when the authorities came to get her, it would be in her best interest to tell them that she had been treated well and received her $5 every month a not so veiled threat to lie on their behalf. And when the commission asked her if she felt like a convict at Kinderloo, she told them that she didn't feel that way till I got that whipping. And when asked if she wanted to go back, she told the commissioners, I'm afraid to go back. He might kill me. Still, she wanted to make sure that her eight-year-old child and her possessions would make their way back to Waycross as soon as possible because they were still there. Her boy was still vulnerable, still in bondage, eight years old. It was the Kafkaesque horror show that made Convict Lee so infamous, and yet Frazier was no convict. She was, in fact, explicitly exonerated of the minor crime for which she had ostensibly been arrested. She didn't even owe money to the county for misdemeanor fines. And yet she was legally sold to the McGrees for $50 to pay attorney's fees for a supposed crime that would have been easy for the sheriff to check. He didn't check, of course, because the arrest was based less on a concern about the morality of men and women living together without a marriage license and more on the payment that officials knew they could get for Frazier from a McGree camp eager to acquire as much free labor as possible. In most southern states following the Civil War, governments provided mechanisms for the easy arrest and government lease of felony convicts to private businesses and planters claiming a lack of prison infrastructure necessitated the diffusion of convicted criminals to various enterprises across the states. In reality, of course, the effort was a scheme to reimpose a version of free bound labor after the constitutional death of slavery. In Georgia, debt peonage, the closest uh, approximation 
of what happened to Lula Frazier. And felony convict lease worked together with the state doling out prisoners under contract with a select number of corporations and large planners to house its felons, and the counties allowing local operators to pay the fines of misdemeanants to use as their own form of bound labor on more limited terms. In the 1880s, however, that dual state county system incorporated two new elements. The first was the development of a new version of county chain gangs to build a road infrastructure in a decidedly rural area. The second element incorporated into the carceral infrastructure in the 1890s cast less of an historical shadow, but would be even more sinister in its operation, a phenomenon that would become the bane of officials already unproblematically running a racialized for-profit bound labor system. Beginning in 1892, private misdemeanor camps would proliferate at the county level, wherein misdemeanors sentenced to a year or less in jail would be leased to local planters, turpentine operations, or sawmills for another version of convict lease in microcosm, with the exception that unlike felony convict lease, such private misdemeanor camps were subject to no oversight, no inspection. They operated as their own private fiefdoms, free to abuse their charges as they saw fit, and free to keep prisoners well beyond their sentences by concocting various fines and charges that transitioned misdemeanants to debt peons, who could stay in such bondage in virtual perpetuity. And because such camps were completely unregulated, because they were operated at the county level, because the victims were not felons, such misdemeanor camps were not included in national screeds bemoaning felony convict lease and the horrors of debt peonage. They operated in the space between felony lease and peonage, binding the two by incorporating elements of both. In the process, they authored some of the worst abuse charges racialized carceral history. Private misdemeanor camps have largely been omitted from the historical narrative of convict lease, but they are vital to that narrative because they provide a connective tissue between the more analyzed elements of felony convict lease and misdemeanor debt peonage. They were the ghost in the machine, a violent middle ground that in plain sight, leaving a lack of state oversight that forced the incarcerated themselves to work with federal prosecutors to seek relief and to publicize the abuses going on in the region. It was a resistance to slavery a half century after slavery had officially run its course. And it was successful. Several federal cases were brought in the Northern District of Florida and the Southern District of Georgia that created anti-peonage precedents and brought national attention to the plight of black-bound labor in what became known as the nation's turpentine belt. Georgia would eliminate its convict lease system, both felony and misdemeanor, in 1908, in part because of the pressure brought to bear by those cases. And many of those cases centered on the South Georgia misdemeanor convict camp called Kinderloo. Located in Lowndes County, near the Florida border and owned by the notorious McRee family. The various branches of the McRee family had descended on the area from Virginia and North Carolina, purchasing the land that would become Kinderloo and building their antebellum wealth with slave labor. The man who would become the patriarch of the postbellum family, George McCree would serve in the Confederacy before coming back to his Lowndes County plantation, where he would continue to use black labor. Some former slaves with nowhere to go after emancipation. But most convicts worked as de facto slaves. In an effort to regain a version of the free labor that they had lost during the war, southern states began creating a variety of new laws, or turning former into felonies so that they could arrest former slaves, then use a lack of prison infrastructure to lease those slaves out as bound laborers. It was an insidious system. 
and one that George McCree openly took advantage of. By 1890, he had more than 8,000 acres of land and four sons to divide it when he died in 1900. Their mother had died young. And George McCree's sister, Lou, had moved in to help raise the children. In honor of her, the plantation became known as Kinderloo, which translates in German as children of Lou. But it wasn't simply a traditional plantation. There was a turpentine still, a cotton gin, a crate factory, a dairy, a cigar factory. They farmed truck crops along with cotton. It was a diversified operation that ran entirely on bound black labor, regularly abused and working for no pay. Valasta, as we all know, was the seat of Lowndes County, just miles to the east of Kinderloo. The city, our city, was founded one month after the election of Abraham Lincoln and four prior to George's secession. After the war, the town became a cotton farming hub for South Georgia, the bulk of former slaves in the region turning to sharecropping to survive. But while sharecropping was a value added for landowners without the resources for acquiring state contracts for felony convict labor, county officials understood that creating a free labor pool more mobile than the proto-feudal tenant system that kept farmers tied to land plots and didn't leave room for the kinds of diversification that entrepreneurs like the McRees wanted to enact was a value added to the local economy. Thus, to help farming and industry develop and thrive, Valdosta and Lowndes County would, in the 1880s, begin the process of arresting small-time black offenders and sentencing them to fines that could be paid by influential white planters, giving those planters a labor force that they could move around as needed for various enterprises, rather than waiting and hoping that a farm tenant or sharecropper would have a healthy crop that would yield some measure of profit. This was a guarantee. It was a galling, overtly racist use of the criminal justice system, and it was a standard of the Deep South white supremacy that enveloped both the state and region. Among all Southern states during this era, explained Martha Myers and James Massey, none exceeded Georgia in the prevalence of repressive mechanisms of social control directed toward blacks. Hundreds of lynchings and legal executions accompanied a black male incarceration rate that ranged between two and a half to nine times higher than the rate for whites. And that is what these charts demonstrate here. You can see the, so if we are starting uh, a carceral system that incentivizes taking former slaves and putting them into bondage, you can see that from that point, the rate of incarceration and how it rises up into the end of what we know as convict lease. And you can see the difference between black and white incarceration rates here in the state from 1870 forward. Um, I know these lines look similar, but you'll notice that the white male incarceration tops out at 15. Um, at 15, we're right here for the black male incarceration. This, this chart is going up to 70, this one only going to 15. So you can see how, even though it doesn't necessarily, the lines don't look different, you can see how um, that gap exists between how we are arresting uh, black people and throwing them into prison specifically so that we can use them as slave labor. And so this is a system that is designed to be racist and cruel. But even in a system designed to be racist and cruel, however, the McGrees were so abusive that they even ran afoul of that standard. In September of 1900, Brooks County Solicitor J.W. Edmondson filed two writs of habeas corpus that led to the release of at least 20 people held without charge on the McGree property. Edmondson traveled to Atlanta to file charges against the McGree convict camp with the state prison commission, complete with affidavits from black victims and prominent white members of the community. Edmondson alleged that the McGrees employed trappers 
to capture black citizens traveling through the area, imprison them, and put them to work on the plantation, knowing that law enforcement would make no real effort to find missing Negroes in South Georgia and North Florida. Under shackles and constant guard, the local Quitman newspaper explained. Men secured in this medieval fashion have been kept in the camp for months and even years. It was nothing more than systematized racial kidnapping. The prison commission responded with hearings at the Lowndes County Courthouse where crowds for the event were so large that they filled both the courthouse itself and the entirety of the courthouse lawn outside. Despite Edmondson's clear evidence, Freeze found plenty of white locals willing to say that Kinderloo was an idyllic place where Negroes were treated well, making the case seem like a he said, she said affair. The final report from the prison commission in 1901 noted the kidnapping and other abuses but urged the county itself to provide oversight for the camp rather than referring the matter for federal charges. They feared that such a move, though justified, would only draw negative publicity to the state and its carceral system. And so the McGrees survived, abetted by white Valdosta, who had been aiding and abetting them all along. They would not face federal charges, or they would not face federal charges until two years later. In 1903, the McGrees were finally indicted by a federal grand jury for illegally holding black citizens, misdemeanants, and selling them into servitude. The case stemmed from a petition sent to federal officials and referred to the Justice Department detailing the experience of several complainants. Brunswick's Mackie Spencer was convicted of selling liquor without a license and sent to serve his misdemeanor sentence at Kinderloo, where he was held three months after his allotted time had expired. Sam Holmes suffered the same fate. David Smith of Waycross received a 30-day sentence for stealing a watermelon, but was sold to Threes who held him for seven months. Henry Wilson suffered an even worse fate acquitted of the charge against him, but sold the Kinderloo to pay his lawyer's fee. He was held there for 11 months. The stories were real. They were horrifying. But their use was precarious, as the bravery of the witnesses clashed with the willingness of white locals in Valdosta to silence their testimony. This picture is actually taken from two decades later. This is Valdosta in the 1920s. Um, but I'm using it here to demonstrate the general racial attitude of whites in the town. The prosecutor's plan was to pretend to drop the matter until convening the grand jury because they knew white Valdosta would try to stop them. Then the attorneys would return from Savannah with a lot of blank subpoenas, bringing in witnesses keeping them in Savannah for grand jury testimony, and then holding them until the trial in protective custody so that white Valdosta could not come and kill them. What that tells us is that federal officials knew that the McCrees were not acting alone, that white Valdosta aided and abetted the murderous kidnapping that took place at Kinderloo and that it would intimidate or kill witnesses that might potentially stop the practice. The benefit to prosecutors was that the trial would be held in Savannah, in this building here, away from the corrupted Lowndes County Courthouse, in front, in front of federal judge Emory Spear. The geography of that and the tenacity of Spear ultimately forced the McRee brothers to plead guilty in federal court, each accepting a $1,000 fine, which would be just over $35,000 in today's money. It was Spears' most influential ruling on the bench. The operation at Kinderloo by 1903 was, in the words of Douglas Blackman, 
operating on a scale no antebellum slave owner could have comprehended. But for all of the horror produced by Kinderloo, the McGrees, the white officials of Valdosta, the real heroes of our story here tonight are those black victims willing to testify in the face of that system. We began the evening by meeting Lula Frazier, who was, like so many others, arrested but never tried for a crime. Even white media in South Georgia was appalled at Frazier's story. She was rightly seen as a victim of the most violent aspects of the Southern apartheid state. But for our purposes here, it's important to also see her testimony as an act of resistance. Her son was still in bondage. The threat to her and others that she loved was still real. And yet she willingly testified against her captors. And that threat was undeniably gendered in its application. I'll give you another example to demonstrate. This one proving that the dangers to black women could come even from presumably friendly sources. In December of 1903, a black Valdosta physician named Maurice Hugh Cobb was arrested by federal marshals on a peonage charge after claiming to be a girl's legal guardian and selling her to the McGrees at Kinderloo. Cobb was one of two black doctors in Valdosta. A, widow, a widower at a young age, in 1901 he married his second wife and the two moved to a large house on South Patterson Street where they rented rooms to black boarders needing a place to stay in the segregated city. This is not that house. Uh, this is the Prescott Hotel, which was also on South Patterson Street, but this is uh, two blocks away from where this house would have been. Lula Durham was only 15 years old. I don't have a picture of her either. Because she wasn't considered important enough to have pictures of, just like Lula Frazier. So let's say this is Lula Durham. Or this. Or this. So Lula Durham was only 15 years old. On her way to White Springs, Florida, home in Vienna, Georgia. Boarding house run by Cobb. Seeing an opportunity, however, Cobb accused Durham of sleeping with a local man and used the charge to blackmail the girl, telling her that he would forgive the affront if she paid him $25. She didn't have the money. And so he and a partner, another black man named George Hart, called Frank McCree, claiming that Durham had been a patient of his medical practice who owed him the $25 for his medical services, which is all just made up. He, Hart, and McGree then pressured the girl to agree to serve time at Kinderloo to pay her supposed debt, keeping her in bondage for three months. Durham's mother hired a lawyer to attempt to free her, but they were forced to fight not on the blackmail charge, but instead on the manufactured claim of restitution for medical services. Ultimately, the mother had to pay the McGrees three-fourths of her quote-unquote debt before her daughter was released. The stories are horrifying. And it was precisely that horror that drew the charges. Peonage itself was sanctioned by the state. Instead, it was Cobb's collusion with the McGrees to abuse the system. And this was not the only time he had served as a functional agent for the McGrees in kidnapping black travelers and sending them on for a cut of the profit. It was his collusion with McGrees to abuse the system, not the system itself, that brought him under legal scrutiny. For all of these abuses, the system went unquestioned. Cobb and Hart received federal charges and appeared before Judge Emery Spear, same judge, in Savannah. 
This sort of thing is bad enough, he argued, when done by white people toward a member of your own race. But it is a great deal worse when done by colored people, he told them, in a case finally decided in March of 1905. I am afraid if you had remained in Africa that you would both have become leaders of bands of slave catchers who swoop down on the unprotected crawls of the Hottentots or Congo and seize the defenseless people and bear them off to sell them into slavery. Cobb pleaded guilty and was ultimately fined $300 uh, in lieu of prison time, which is $10,000 in today's money for legitimately kidnapping people. 100 years later, Angela Davis explained that black women endured the cruelties of the convict Lee system unmitigated by the feminization of punishment. Neither their sentences nor the labor they were compelled to do were lessened by virtue of their gender. Frazier experienced those cruelties, however, with a decided feminization of punishment. Her vulnerability all the more pronounced because of the sexual outlet she could provide to rapists unwilling to countenance her humanity and the satisfaction she could give to a new husband foisted upon her as part of her supposed punishment. We don't know about Durham's vulnerabilities on this count, but it's fair to say that we can speculate. Frazier's case was unique in that it became a national story. Durham's never did. What media accounts didn't understand, however, was the dependency of such peonage and kidnapping actions on the maintenance of private misdemeanor convict lease and the lack of state oversight that allowed such abuses to happen. For all the horrors of traditionally understood felony convict lease camps, and they were certainly horrible, Frazier's ordeal would not have happened there without conviction and direct purchase from the state. But here, Frazier's case wasn't the exception. It was the rule. And yet the case brought against the South Georgia peonage and misdemeanor convict scheme focused on abuses within the system rather than on the existence of that system itself. And because of that lack of focus, that white desire to protect the system that was charging, Speer gave the Marys $1,000 fines, allowing the other counts to rest during good behavior, he argued. Even though federal peonage charges were misdemeanors by definition, had Speer been less charitable, the counts amassed against the McRees carried a total potential of $65,000 in fines and up to 65 years in prison. That none of that actually happened stood as a testament to the real obstacles resistors like Frazier faced when choosing to put themselves in harm's way to engage in such testimony. This was a criminal trial that Frazier no financial restitution for her ordeal, and yet she was able to alert the nation to the existence of such camps, even though media reports got them wrong and amalgamated felony convict lease and misdemeanor convict lease as the same functional thing. Federal Judge Speer, though, did have a role in making the case into a cause celeb. What hope? can the respectable Negro have? What incentive to better effort or better life if he, his wife, his daughters, or his sons may in a moment be snatched from his humble home and sold into peonage? Still, the judge fined those involved $1,000 each, didn't give them any jail time, and later reduced those fines. No one served jail time never experienced their own version of involuntary bondage. The McGrees were threatened with new charges in 1904, but negotiated their way out of them. Then there was the Durham case in 1905. 
Edward McGree died the following year in 1906, but the family still continued its convict program. The negative publicity of such abuses, however, had finally worked on state legislators. In 1908, the convict lease system in Georgia, taking effect in 1909. In April of that year, as one of the last payments as part of the mo one of the most insidious systems in American history, the McCree estate was charged $5,617.11 as the last payment made for felony convicts before the formal end of the federal, uh, of the convict lease system. Felons, of course, were still used as bound labor after 1908, but they were used by counties on chain gangs for public road work. They were no longer in private hands like those of the McGrees. That system also had many problems and much violence associated with it. But at least it wasn't Kinderloo. As for the McGrees, their fortunes dwindled after losing their slave labor. They eventually sold most of their land to the J.N. Bray Company, who in 1946 sold most of that to South Carolina's Taylor Colquitt Company. It was, at the time, one of the largest regional real estate deals in decades and began the company's and the city's interest in the telephone pole industry, an interest that would remain an integral part of the Valdosta economy into the 21st century. Much of that land would then be used to build an upscale subdivision. That the majority of Kinderloo's residents today are now white and relatively wealthy, and the majority of the residents of what is now the Valdosta State Prison, eight miles away, are now black and relatively poor, seems, if nothing else, on the nose. The geography has shifted, but the realities of carceral life are, in many ways, very similar. And it is with that geography that I'd like to close with a message in particular to our students who are here tonight. We are here at VSU surrounded by a violent racial geography. Mary Turner was murdered off exit 29 on I-75. The crimes of Kinderloo happened just off Highway 84. The last murder of the 1918 race riot happened at a house that still stands on South Troop Street. The tree behind the gas station just west of the new Quick Trip off Exit 18 was a lynching tree. Down by the railroad tracks downtown, a white policeman and his son beat a sleeping black man to death in the early 1950s, bringing some of the first federal civil rights charges ever submitted by the federal government. We are inundated these days by racial violence, by racial controversies. But all of them exist within a historical geography that surrounds all of us. It is around us every single day. And we can't understand the things that happen today without understanding how we got here. Our Africana Studies minor can give you the kind of grounding that will allow you to see the town and the state, the country, the world around you with more knowledgeable eyes. When we live in a place like this, with a history like this, it is more necessary than ever. You should all come join us. It's only 15 hours. <laughs> it's a minor for your degree. And more importantly, it is context for your life. It helps ensure that the crimes like those of Kinderloo never happen again. Thank you very much, everybody. Convicts that the Kinderloo has taken are adults, and some of them are very small children. And these are all um, essentially proto-slaves in the early 20th century. 50 years after slavery has technically ended. And uh, this is uh, just right outside of the city limits um, uh, on, I on Highway 84. 
So while we look at that, does anyone have any questions that I might be able to answer for you? Yes, sir. I, 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 I have a question, but more in the form of a comment. Uh, I just want to take this opportunity. I'm going to get to free press, and I have too many views on my channel on YouTube, and you all can see this video on Boston DVR on YouTube. But here's what I want to say to my black brothers and sisters. Often we criticize white people because of what happened in the past. I've been doing civil rights work since 1975, and I will assure you that when we go to pre I go to presentations such as this, there may be a black doctorate or whatever professional that speaks, but the white Caucasians have done so much work to go and dig up what was here. And in some cases, if it was not for the white folks, people would never know this because we couldn't get behind the closed doors to get the information. I have helped white people. True. I, still had it, I stayed in the hallway. They went in and got the information. But when they brought it out by the mayor of religion, I tell you, it was a piece of cake. And I just would like to give all the Caucasian people who have a right mindset to dig history and to assist black folk along with white folk who want to do what's right to move this country forward. Thank you very much. Absolutely. I'm all for Caucasians. Go Caucasians. Absolutely. Big fan. Big fan. Uh, uh, definitely. Yes, ma'am. So, in an age where uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, African American history, and ethnic studies, socioeconomic assistance and reparations are being lambasted, misrepresented, criticized as reverse racism um, by the party that represents the majority of our own stuff, and politicians such as District Representative 175, uh, John LaHood, Kemp of Florida, and Governor DeSantis. What do you have to say to the um, audience here about how crimes of places such as Tennessee might affect black residents of South Georgia or just Georgia overall today? Well, I'll tell you, the good old boys were pissed off that we were even having this talk tonight. I don't, I don't know why they would be so offended, but they were. Um, and it's interesting that you say that. Um, so first of all, for our students, there is no such thing as reverse racism. Uh, that is not a concept that exists in the world. You cannot have racism without power, and white people have power. The idea of reverse racism is stupid. The first time somebody says that, don't ever trust anything else they say. <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. But you're right that these things come under criticism quite a bit. And I think what we have to do as students and as scholars, we have to parse the bitter with the better. Because, I think, you can make a decent argument against some of the things that we, on our particular side of the political aisle, do. There is an argument to be made against, uh, I don't know, uh, affirmative action. It's not a good one, but you can make one that's legitimate. That's not one that I agree with, but you can do that without being a bigot. You can make an argument against affirmative action. You can make a good argument against reparations without being a bigot. Now, what we have to do is take arguments on face value. We cannot judge these people because of their background. We need to judge them on the quality of their arguments. And if they make a good argument, argue with them. If not, you can dismiss them as racists and bigots, but there are arguments against a lot of these things that aren't terrible. And so what we need to do is to do for them what they have never done for us, and that is try to strongman their arguments and to see if you can make anything out. And doing that, I think, is the way to uh, maintain our sanity in these kinds of ad hominem attacks. The reality is the vast majority of people who take my black history classes are black. And it's not because our white population of students is racist. It's just because many of them don't assume that that's for them. Because they have come from a climate that says, well, that's, that's for somebody else. That's not for me. And so all those people who end up making absurd claims about colorblindness and all this other ridiculous stuff that makes absolutely no sense in the world 
are doing so not necessarily out of a place of hatred. They're doing it out of a place of ignorance because they've never been exposed to anything that really has happened here. And so our job as people who study this stuff is to get it out to as many people as possible. During slavery, an average white person in South Georgia never moved 20 miles from where they were born. They had a circumference of 20 miles. That was it. They never left anywhere else. They didn't know any other life. And because anti-slavery literature was banned in the region, they had no reason to, to know the arguments against the way society was. They just assumed that was the way it was because they didn't know any different. They, in a way, were victims too. And the vast majority of them didn't actually own slaves because they were poor. They were bigots. But they were bigots because they didn't know any better and they had never had information to tell them otherwise. Our job is to ensure that everybody has as much information as possible. Because if you don't have the information, you have an excuse. But the minute you know what really went on, it's on you. And you do become a bigot. And you do become somebody who is a legitimately bad person if you don't acknowledge what actually happened because you knew it and you chose to ignore it. And so our job is to force that issue, to use the kinds of research that we gain to put people in a position to make those decisions. And not all of them are gonna make the decisions that we want. And on certain issues, reparations, things like that, there are arguments. But you can make good arguments that I don't happen to agree with against those things. But on other things, you can't. On the idea of equity, you can't. And if you know what happens in history, it takes away all of those excuses from the other side. Our job is to let them know. And to let them know with, I think, relative sympathy, because they are in an information bubble that doesn't allow them to learn the kinds of things that are actual, you know, historical facts. Yes, ma'am. Hello, yeah. So I might say that um, knowledge is important and also taking me back to all the questions. information, the people who try to make their argument by making sure you don't know all the facts, they're always the bad guys. There's never been one time in history, never, when somebody has said, all right, we've got to keep this information from them because if they know it, they will try to be more equal. That person has never been the good guy. Those people are the worst, but they have, importantly, I think, been here since the 1600s. What is going on with our education system might be a little bit new. It's not really. We didn't get black studies until 1968. And the only reason we got it is because black students in California fought to get it and then it spread across the country because black students wouldn't go to college unless they got it. Before 1968, there was no black history class. The dominant theory of slavery came from uh, a historian named Dunning who argued that slaves were happy and that it was a great thing. And everybody just accepted it. But black studies is new. Black studies is younger than some of the people in this room. And so the idea that people are going to try and push back against it and not allow it to continue, we can see from a variety of examples throughout history that never works. You can't put knowledge back in a box, just like you can't put toothpaste back in a tube. It's out there. There's no way they can stop it. And if they can stop 
a certain class from teaching a certain thing, and they can affect a curriculum in a certain way, they can't stop libraries. They can't stop hearing you talk to people. They can't stop documentaries. They can't stop YouTube or, or YouTuber. We can't stop, they can't stop any of that. And so they can try. And no matter what kind of wins they have along the way, the one thing they won't win is that. It doesn't matter whether it's the Bible or it's Shakespeare. Evil always outs. Information always wins. Yeah. Well, what Dr. Ayala was saying, we are probably more very concerned about the uh, mandates from the Taliban. <laughs> that are leaving in droves. They are, but the ones that are standing down there says it doesn't matter what the Santa says in Tallahassee, it's not in my classroom. They're not going to mass fire teachers because if they do that, they create martyrs and they become bad guys. Even to them. Yes, ma'am. This is a little bit different than what we were talking about, sorry. Um, but I just kind of wanted to know how you conducted your research. I noticed that there was a watermark on one of the photos that said Georgia Archives, so I'm assuming you didn't do it here in our archives. So, um, first of all, let me give a plug for the Lowndes County Historical Society, um, who, does, who does an amazing job of cataloging the history of our area. They are another archive for us. We, we have a great archive here, but LCHS also does an amazing job of keeping a repository of all the things that have happened here. And yes, the Georgia State Archives in Morrow, um, just before you get to Atlanta, they're on the, the Clayton State exit on I-75, are an amazing resource. It is there that you can find both Georgia's um, repository for the National Archives and the Georgia State Archives, which have all kinds of things. I was able at the Georgia State Archives to find all of the lease reports that were turned in, all of the investigations, all of the, the memos sent back and forth bemoaning Kinderloo and what it was doing to Georgia's reputation. All that stuff is there in the Georgia State Archives in Morrow. There is some stuff in the Federal Archive in Morrow as well, pertaining in particular to the prosecutions of the McCree family in 1901 and 1903 in federal court, the first time that had really happened. Um, so yes, there are lots of different avenues to us, and we are positioned in a really good place to be able to do this kind of research. The turpentine belt that I mentioned is all of South Georgia and all of North Florida where turpentine was a big concern. The McGrees are notorious, but they are not the only one. Um, a couple of years after their case, there was a case called um, U.S. v. Clyatt, which happened in Tifton, where guys in Tifton were going down to Florida promising black workers in North Florida jobs and then just kidnapping them and putting them into bondage where they would work for years. And they got busted too, precisely because of the original McCree prosecution. We didn't really have time to talk about that. And so there are prosecutions going on in Pensacola and Savannah, the home of the Northern District of Florida and the Southern District of Georgia. And so there are also great archives that deal with a lot of our area in Tallahassee. The Tallahassee, the Florida State Archive in Tallahassee also has a lot of our stuff just because we're in their orbit so much. And so there are lots of great avenues for us to do research that are relatively easy for us to get to. The information is out there. And if you are interested in doing projects on these kind of things, I promise you, anyone in the history department, uh, you can just come to us and we will point you in the right direction and show you how to do that kind of work uh, so that you can find out these things on your own. I promise you it is rewarding. Yes, sir. You said you faced opposition, said this so kind of curious as to what Dude, I don't even know. I mean, everybody was pissed off about this. I, whenever somebody gets mad at something I'm doing, nobody ever comes and tells me. <laughs> nobody ever says anything to me. I just hear about it secondhand. Nobody ever wants to come and just say, hey. And so, apparently they didn't like our flyer at first, and then apparently it was, I don't know, it was being passed around the state legislature and they were pissed off about it. I don't know. This happened 120 years ago. I mean, Jesus, I have no idea. It was crazy. Um, I mean, nothing here, I think, probably that you heard tonight seems subversive. 
Uh, I, have, I have no idea uh, what they were mad about. I really don't. Uh, yes, sir. I'm John Robinson, and I have an audience here on the second floor, and I'm concerned about how do we address the economic oppression that resulted from this today? That's a good question. The McGrees um, lost all the wealth that they accrued from Kinderloo. Uh, they slowly started to die out in the rest of the 19 zeros and then into the 1910s. Um, as they sold off, all of them moved to Valdosta, where they died in relative poverty. But you're right that Lowndes County, while they weren't making money specifically off of Kinderloo, while it was very much a private enterprise, they benefited from having wealthy landowners in the region. That's the reason why Ed McCree was elected to the legislature. I mean, he was indicted while he was a member of the state legislature. Um, so you're right that Lowndes County did see some benefit from that, even though they didn't make money on it. I think more appropriate to that conversation is what happens after 1908. Because it's after 1908 when Lowndes County starts actively taking all those convicts that they would have given to the McRees and putting, putting them in county camps. They are the reason we have all of our state highways. All of our state highways were built with convict labor. Um, and that, our county clearly profited on. That is a direct, um, quantifiable uh, way of determining the wealth that accrued to Lowndes County from bound black labor. That's something you could actually, I, I wouldn't exactly know how to do it because I am not a math person, but that is something you could actually put a number on. And I think uh, what might be beneficial in that regard is to do that kind of work, to try to, to do the kind of work of what a man hour was in 1910 and how and let's let's add up all the man hours that were used from bound labor who never got paid that were working for Lowndes County and living in these camps added up in the new compound interest ever since that point I think that's how you come to figures like that um, I, I, I wouldn't know exactly how to do that just because no math uh, but um, but it is doable it is not really doable for Kinderloo because the value that accrued to the community is negligible. I mean, this was all for private profit, and that profit went away. That doesn't really exist anymore. But there are, there are cases to make. We never had a, um, uh, well, we did have one other convict camp here in what was called Lumbertown, which is now Remerton. Uh, uh, they had a convict camp there, too. It didn't have, um, uh, as much negativity attached to it, and they only used convicts for three years. <coughs> Theirs was a much shorter run uh, because white, poor white people got upset because they needed jobs, and why are you using these convicts when you could just hire us to, to work there? So that didn't last terribly long. But we could do that for, um, <coughs> for Emerton, for sure. I mean, they, they very much benefited from convict labor as well. There are ways to add those things up. Um, and once we got into county camps, you had to submit, submit reports every month. So we can actually track hours. I can't do that for Kinderloo. I can't track hours of work. I can't track um, uh, the specific number of people that are there at any one time because they're not submitting reports. Because they're a misdemeanor convict camp, they acted outside of the recognized system. So I can't be that kind of granular with Kinderloo. But you could. You could with county road camps. You could with Lumbertown. You could with other places like that. It, I think it just um, probably would require um, a dual effort, maybe, of an historian and a mathematician getting together to try to, to figure out those numbers. Man, that would really make them mad. If I came up with a number, they need to say, then they'd really hate me. <laughs> yes, sir? Uh, one last question. Um, yeah. I know you're a historian. So I was wondering if you um, heard about Kennedy Johnson. That whole situation. <laughs> Heard about it. Lived it. Lived it. Lived it. His family was in my class when it happened. Oh my God. In middle school. In yeah. Grade. No. Right. I'm curious. What's your thoughts about that? If you have. Oh, I have lots of thoughts on Kendrick Johnson. I mean, I, I mean, I think everybody does. I mean, we all know who did it, and 
we all know that uh, it was covered up and uh, the people who did it were not arrested specifically because they were friends of law enforcement. Um, that case itself, though, I think is less important to us for the fact that it is a murder that went unpunished and more for the the historical legacy that it demonstrates. We have a lot of bodies around the county. A lot of bodies uh, that were killed in incidents, some of them specifically racialized in the violence, and some of them racialized in the lack of punishment after the violence. Kenner Johnson, I think, is important to us partly because he deserves, you know, justice. But historically speaking, I think he's important because he demonstrates that the kind of things that we talk about in here still matter. You know, you can come to the history department and we will teach you all kinds of interesting things. You can take a class on the French Revolution. The French Revolution is awesome, very exciting, and you can learn all about it. But when you walk out of class, you don't have to think anymore about the French Revolution. The French Revolution is interesting, but it doesn't play on your life every day. You go to a black history class, and immediately you walk out the door, you feel the oppression that exists all around us. You live every day with microaggressions on this campus. Last semester, we had a teacher write the N-word on the board. Last semester, we had the baseball coach uh, kick somebody off the team and then not get fired for it. We have racial stuff happen here all the time, and our black students go into black history classes and know that when they walk out the door after class, they no longer have a space where they can talk about that in mixed company, and they just kind of have to live with it. Kendrick Johnson is an, is an indictment of us all that this has happened, and it is here, and it is a big version version of what all the rest of Black Valdosta feels on a daily basis in much smaller doses. And it all stems from the same place, from the kind of um, history that allows places like Kenderloo, that allows events like the, the race riot of 1918 and the lynching of Mary Turner, that allows that ugly Klan picture from Valdosta that I showed you in the 1920s. I'm not saying that the people here now are in the Ku Klux Klan, certainly they're not. Certainly there is some measure of quote unquote progress that has been made, but when we deny the legacy of those things and the lived geography of race that surrounds us every day, it's easy for white people to forget because they don't have to feel it. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so I'm asking you two questions, but have you ever known a person after Jimmy Johnson's death, and I put it in association with how things are covered up here and never talked about? You ever heard about somebody being on a criminal trust plan for 13 years after that young man was killed? Accidental murder. You ever heard anything about that? Anybody else in the room heard anything about a person that put on a criminal trespass and they did nothing wrong? They just didn't want them to go on the campus and use a camera? Well, that's, that's why they banned me. They didn't want the truth to get out. They knew that if those children talked to me, I was going to report it. And so what they did, the sheriff stopped me and said, you can't go to no Lyons County High School probably after KJ was killed. And do you not know? That no news media, no newspaper, no radio, no television in Florida or Georgia ever published that I have been put under the criminal trespass. And they sent me a letter telling me we can't find nothing on you, but that wasn't the question. My question to them was, why don't you remove me in writing because you did it and now nobody did it? There's something strange about that KJ case. And I don't know why God put me, allowed me to be put on a criminal trespass, but I'm enjoying it every day. <laughs> we, call that, we call that good trouble. Um, no, I think that's right. And I think that is a modern version of the $1,000 fine to the McCreeps. The let's just make this go away. We do not want this information out there. We want, we benefit from silence. And so the way you get that silence is to make things a non-entity. You either keep 
thing, you keep information from getting out. And in these day and age, of course, we have cameras and things like that that they did not have then. Or you give people a slap on the wrist, let it go away. They have a conviction, but it's not the kind of conviction that's going to get national news because it's only a $1,000 fine. If the McGrees get 65 years in prison, all of a sudden, the story of Kinderloo is going to blow up nationally. That's going to be a huge deal. We don't do that. We chastise them. We tell them they're bad people, but then we give them a $1,000 fine. It's the same kind of thing. We have been working to create silences in our information stream for a long time. Um, and that is the way we deal with ourselves and allow ourselves to feel like we are the good guy. Because make no mistake, everybody in all of these stories thinks that they are the good guy. Um, no, we don't have any evil schemers. They all think they're right, even though they're usually not. Yes, sir. So now, now that we have this information, and uh, more people have information about some of the uh, streets in Valdosta named after slaveholders, yeah. their families, even buildings on this campus named after families of slaveholders. Right. Where do we go from here? Now that this type of information is getting out there, what, what would you like to see happen for Kinderloo, for the street names, for the Confederate statue in the, our town square? Uh, I don't know. I, you know, uh, when historians write stuff, we're not we're not thinking about that. You know, the the argument here, which I know you guys don't care about as much, but the argument here is about misdemeanor convict camps in general, which has never been talked about in the historical record. And the reason to write this book was specifically to rewrite the historiography of convict lease, which isn't as sexy, I know, but is the reason why I did this, specifically to show that there is this third element that we never... Did I do that? I don't know. Uh, no, it's still up here. It just got tired. It's been on the same picture for a long time. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know if, if um, somebody who spends his time looking backwards uh, is really the most qualified person to, to suggest things looking forwards. Uh, we don't really go into our research thinking about things like that. Um, I, uh, uh, I don't know if there's anything specifically that can uh, come of the Kinderloo thing except for a broader contextualization of how we got to where we are now. I don't think there needs to be any kind of public display of, of uh, uh, reconciliation or anything. I mean, the McGrees are long dead. Every, you know, all this is, these are all people that are long gone. But, um, but I, think, I, think, I think just knowing about it and making sure everybody else knows about it is the best we can do in those situations. And that's usually what the historian's major goal is, just to get everybody to know. Yes, sir. Can I add a little bit more to that? Absolutely. So yeah, I, I would agree with you when it comes to like letting people around you know. I also think like seeing more people like actively look at the way that the system still is and kind of come together, start to organize and form ways to actually make direct changes to the things that you see are wrong around in society. So you said um, there's buildings that were named by us around like slaveholders. Why don't we come together and establish that fact to someone who is higher up, get that building name changed as a collective, you can do that. As an individual, you may not have so much power. But as you get more information, they always say, the more you know, the better you do. So with the information we're all gathering, I agree, and I think that we should try to do better and try to organize and make a better change. I think that's fair. I think historians, we tend not to think along those lines because we're just looking backwards. But I think our goal is to give you that information so that people can take it and do something with it. Um, that we are kind of doing the grunt work for you, you guys, to go out and actually take this and, I don't know, do whatever you do. Uh, uh, but, but you're right. I mean, there are certainly um, actionable items here in the kinds of things we talked about tonight. I'm just... I, I'm not 100% sure what those might be exactly because we spend most of our time uh, just dealing with dead people. We're not we're not great with people who are actually alive. Uh, 
we're far more comfortable <laughs> with dead people. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So um, I guess perhaps it would be, I'm just adding to the conversation. Okay. Um, so maybe it would help to hear from another black person. Mm -hmm. um, especially a black person who's kind of come, so I grew up in abject poverty, mm -hmm. and then I moved in with a very much upper class relative. I have seen the difference in treatment. I have seen a difference in treatment between when I have my hair straightened versus when I have locks. Oh, yeah. When I um, talk in the dialect that I speak at home versus the dialect that I'm speaking to you guys in now. So I think that is one actionable thing that can be done. Um, and I'm actually sorry addressing this to the white people in the room. When you um, leave from the north side of the house and you enter the south side, why is it that you feel a little bit threatened if you see a group of black people? When you see someone in sagging pants and you see a black boy in a hoodie, those are things to question about yourself. And it's going to hurt, but you have to realize that racism is not individual. Racism is embedded to every part of our country. Um, that is true. So, and it's kind of a cruel irony too, because um, people will deny that segregation still exists, but there's a black side and there's a white side. Okay, we have uh, the Kinderloo Golf Boys Club, right? Um, the plantation was named Kinderloo, Children of Loo. So, um, and we know what family owns the Kinderloo Golf Club. Their name is actually on the buildings here. Uh, we have the Kinderloo Plantation Home, which is also on our or, sorry, Kinderloo Plantation Neighborhood, which is also on our side. We know what racial demographic makes up that area. We know what major highway was built through what neighborhood. So, again, there are certain things that you can acknowledge, certain things you can start to question. It does not make you a bad person when you realize, I feel some type of way towards, you know, a woman who is talking, quote unquote, ghetto, you know, it just means that you grew up in America. The schools did not give you the tools to handle it. And you have the opportunity and you have, you. everyone has access to the internet now. Um, you have the ability to make that change and start questioning those things yourself. So that's more so my comment. Um, start listening to and talking to black people a little bit more too. Um, ones who aren't respectful. So that's, that's the term. That's the term. There, I would be a respectable one. Um, I've been told I'm not like other ones, but at the same time, I'm also be called the N word. I'm only 21 years old. So, yeah. That's true. Um, that is certainly uh, a reality for a lot of people. Um, there is a divide between uh, our black college population here and the town population, uh, who never really has those kinds of opportunities. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois called that double consciousness, this idea that to be black in America means you have to be two people at once. You are one, pe you are one person uh, around your own people, and then you have to create these masks, what he called a veil, uh, around mixed company. Uh, that was true from the earliest days of slavery, when slaves survived by pretending to be stupid in front of owners because that's what they knew they wanted, even though they were obviously very smart, knew exactly what was going on, all the way up to today. That has never changed. That code switching that exists for everybody that has to live um, uh, as a minority in America, that is just, that is part of, you're absolutely right, and that is uh, definitional, and does end up creating rifts between say, for example, the college campus and its quote-unquote quasi-respectability and everybody else who doesn't have those opportunities. Yes, ma'am. You just reminded me of when you said the two different um, personalities. So my mom, she would say, well, my mom, she works at defense in Cornell. Uh -huh. And she works like at the front day, so most of the time, like, new people would come up there with an attitude. And my mom, well, she would tell me, um, sometimes they'll either get Katrina with a K or Katrina with a C. <laughs> no, right, absolutely. No, you, you gotta have both, right? Um, you gotta have both. And it does, it does condition how you respond to people. Um, and 
There have been cognitive scientists who have shown us that it also conditions how your brain works. That your, your brain can actually work in two different ways depending on how you have code switched to engage in certain kinds of behavior. The kinds of code switching that people like me would never have to do. I can just be whoever I am whenever, wherever I want to be. My brain doesn't go into that change. I don't have to do that snap back and have two separate cognizant ways of seeing the world uh, because I've never had it ingrained in me in this double consciousness. And so we're not just talking about behavioral stuff. We're talking about actually switching brain chemistry uh, for the bulk of the black population, particularly in the South, where uh, uh, there is a more critical mass of racial difference uh, uh, in a way that there isn't uh, in some other parts of the country. Yes, ma'am. Is there anything in your research that showed exactly where the McCree House was located? No. Uh, well, yes and no. I'm probably not the best person to answer that. Uh, Okay, now let's see if we can get this to turn back on. Yeah, and I have, and there's a, we have a map drawn for us by, that is available at, I don't know what happened. I don't know. It's not, I'm pushing. I'm assuming with 8,000 acres, it was both sides of... Of the or right. So what originally happened, so there was one major plantation house. When the guy dies, the land splits into four, and they build four plantation houses. So we're really talking about five kind of plantation mansions on the property. Um, three of them were engaged in this kind of labor. One of them just kind of did his own thing. He was kind of the weirdo. Uh, but the other three were doing that. And so we have five different houses. All five of them were destroyed by fire um, uh, eventually. So, so none of them are around anymore. We don't have any remains of them. But, but we do have a plot out kind of where they might be just on a hand-drawn map um, that I cannot reshow you because, I'll try to turn it because of this. Any other questions? Are the McCrees buried in Valdosta? Yeah, there's a McCree street. I mean, speaking of streets, there's a McCree uh, street, absolutely. Um, they were uh, big time people. Yes, they are mostly buried in Valdosta because by the time most of them died, they had moved out from Kinderloo. They had sold off. They, they had lost their fortune after the death of convict lease and had moved to Valdosta. So to move into town. And they were living in small houses here because their fortune was gone. Um, they were not wealthy when they died. They were not um, as vaunted as they had been in the late 1800s in the first decade of the 20th century. But yes, they, they die in Valdosta. Yeah. Was Lou one of the, the four children, were they all boys? All boys. And she was a wife of one of the boys? No, no, no. She was the sister of their father. George McCree was kind of the, the patriarch of the family. His wife has these four kids and then dies, very young. Um, and his sister, Lou, who did not live in the area, came and moved to Kinderloo to help him raise the children. And since they are of German heritage, they named the plantation Kinderloo in honor of her for, for coming and moving here and uh, helping to raise the boys who would become the, the, the landowners of Kinderloo. So she was, she was their, I guess, aunt. You keep referencing the South. Do you think the North is better? No. I, well, I mean, I think the North is different. I think the North is different. I think there's a critical mass of black people here that they don't have in most northern areas except in urban hubs. I mean, we still have more than 50% of the black population in the South. This is... This is the area where we come into interracial contact more than any other place. And so, no, white supremacy is systemic in the nation. It is built into the fabric of everything we've done since 1620. But, um, uh, but the South is, I think, fundamentally unique. I don't think that it's more or less racist. I don't think the North is better or worse. I just think we do have regional differences in the way that we enact our um, uh, interracial contact and, and reactions. Uh, that's that's all I mean by that. I'm not, I'm not making a value judgment. I'm just saying that, yes. that there is different ways of that interacting because we have such. I mean, our population in Boston is majority black. Elaine, a short comment. 
I'm retired military. Uh -huh. I'm from down south, south, south. And I respect the Caucasian better, the one that was down south, than the ones up north. And the reason they, 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 they let us know they didn't like you. They're honest. Oh, yeah. That's right. They knew it was a frown, not a smile. All right, everybody. We are all tired, so everybody is leaving. Thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I don't know. That was weird. I mean, when I was over here, I kind of bumped it, and that's when it turned off, so maybe it was me. I don't know. All right, thanks. Of course, of course. The book will be out, the book will be out in, I think, probably November. Uh, it's, it's at the press. It's doing all the stuff, so it, the book on Kindle should be out in November. Perfect. Yeah. We're doing that. Book signing. And if you want, okay. Hey man, sure. I mean, that won't be for the next, or, but yeah, sure. Thank you.